There was a time in this fair land when the real road Hey everybody, this is Mike Current, aka Old Man in the PCT. As you probably can imagine, I did postpone my uh, through hike of the Pacific Crest Trail, uh, but now I'm, I'm ready to get on trail. So I wanted to put out this video and update you uh, what's been going on and my decision process and uh, how my, my through hike is gonna change a little bit based on the current situation and talk about uh, through hiking and COVID-19 uh, in general. So that's what we're covering over this video. Uh, yes, I know I am violating one of my own ground rules. If you watch my introduction video, you know that I do not believe in prep videos, pre-trail videos. Uh, I said my la next video was going to be uh, me on the on the trail, but so much has happened. I thought it was important to, to get that information out before I actually begin getting on the trail, which will be happening pretty soon, uh, mid-May. Uh, don't know the exact date yet. I'm finalizing that, but it will be in the mid-May time period that I, I get on trail. So I did decide to delay my through hike. And before I get into that, um, I, I just want to Tell everybody, look, if you're in the situation that, that I was in, um, delaying your, your through hike or canceling your through hike this year due to, to COVID-19, uh, I can empathize and sympathize with you. I mean, that is an incredibly um, difficult decision to make, and I fully support you in your decision. Um, if you stayed on the trail during this time period and or got on the trail subsequently, I fully support you as well. I mean, we live in a great country, um, and as long as we're not doing something illegal, we're big boys and girls, and we can make responsible decisions. And so I fully support you in your decisions as well. For me, I decided to postpone my through hike based on what was going on. Uh, and that was an absolutely devastating decision to make uh, for for four days, I literally laid in bed, uh, ate C's chocolates, because um, they're the best, watched old westerns on t television, and just generally felt sorry for myself. Uh, and then around day four, one of my favorite sayings popped into my head. Uh, it's from the, the movie Shawshank Redemption. Uh, the character Andy, played by Tim Robbins, you probably know the saying. At one point, he sits there and says, you have a choice. You can get busy living or you can get busy dying. And that's when I realized I wasn't doing myself any good by sitting um, or, or laying in bed and doing nothing. So I got up and I started analyzing my options. Uh, I looked at what would be the latest date I could leave Campo and realistically complete a northbound through hike and be safely at the northern terminus. I looked at that. I looked at the southbound window. When's the start period? When's the end period? I looked at that. I looked at my resupply strategy and how could that be affected. Uh, and then I stayed in shape. I kept myself busy. I stayed in shape and I analyzed the situation and was trying to make a determination when would be best to, to go out. Um, and, and then I decided, hey, it's time to go. California is starting to open back up. The governor said, hey, uh, trail running and, and hiking is, is something that is allowed. Um, for the organizations that actually control and have the authority to open or close uh, the Pacific Crest Trail, most, most of those organizations kept the trail open throughout this entire time period. And for those areas, it was actually closed based on the progression of way things are going. Uh, I believe those areas will be open by the time that I get to, to that border. Uh, so I'm confident and, and now is the time uh, for, for me to get out on trail. Now, a couple couple changes uh, for for the trail. First, I will not be blog blogging for the trek. Um, uh, Zach Badger Davis, who owns the trek, he's an absolutely great guy. He really is. But he's in a tough spot right now. Uh, as a backpacker, he gets it. He understands backpacking. He understands the the low impact, low threat, it, it really does have. But, but at the same time, he owns a business and he needs to protect his business. And, and to do that, he needs to be conservative in a time of uncertainty. 
And so right now the Trek is not showing any blogs or vlogs or articles that depict hiking at this time. Now that can change tomorrow, that can change next week, that can change next month, we don't know. But right now the Trek is, is not doing that. So through emails, um, Zach and I agreed, hey, I'm just gonna go ahead and set up my own uh, YouTube channel. Look, I didn't, I, I, I wasn't gonna make any money vlogging for the trek it's one of the things you agree to when you vlog for them they make money on your videos you don't i'm not looking to make a brand this is a one and done deal i just want to have fun with the videos while i'm hiking that's why i'm doing it for family and friends and, and if you want to join along come along uh if for some reason my youtube channel actually makes money um, I'm gonna say right now I will take all that money and I will roll it into a charity my son and I contribute to my son and I we, we own a business together and the profits on one facet of that business goes all towards um, a local veterans organization that supports uh, uh, veteran families and in if for some reason, my YouTube channel actually makes any money. I will take all that money and donate it to, to that organization. Again, I'm just doing this for fun, and, and, I, and I hope you, you, you enjoy the videos. Um, so that's the, the first thing that's going to be changing. I will be posting on my own YouTube channel instead of on the Trek. Now, the, the second change is I'm adding three ground rules to my journey. Now, if you remember from the introduction video, I had some ground rules on putting together the videos, and now I'm adding three, three additional ground rules on uh, my through hike. The first ground rule that I'm adding is I will not be getting into any vehicles during my entire journey. Now, originally, I was going to fly into San Diego. Scout and Fro was going to pick me up. I was going to stay at their house, drive me out to the Campo. You know, the quintessential start of any Pacific Crest Trail hike. It was going to be great. Well, of course, that didn't happen. Now, I'm ready to go. I have no desire to get on a plane or get into a bus where I could potentially get sick. Uh, fortunately, uh, our house is around the midway point between the southern and the northern terminus so it is feasible for us to drive to either either area so um, mid may time period my wife and sister are going to drive me down to campo and kick me out of the car and when that happens that'll be the last time i get into a vehicle until the end of my journey now for that reason um, i've adjusted my my resupply strategy. If you recall, I had 30 resupply boxes. Um, since I'm going to have to be walking into all the towns to pick up those resupply boxes, uh, there are some of them I just didn't want to walk that far to get into. So I've consolidated. I've gone from 30 resupply boxes down to 16. Uh, and there's a lot of small towns that I'm not going to be going into. Um, just because I will not have a need, I will have the food on my back, and I just don't want to travel that distance uh, walking into them. So yes, I'm going to be missing towns like Julian, Idlewild, uh, Bishop, um, Bend, uh, Ashland, Leavenworth, those towns I will be not going into simply because I'm choosing to walk all the miles, uh, including all the miles into my resupply points. Um, so that is ground rule number one. Ground rule number two uh, is this is going to be an entirely self-supported through hike. Uh, what that means is I have to go in and, and pick up the resupply boxes or I have to go in and shop. Nobody can support me with that. And, and this one was a little actually more difficult than the first one because uh, our house is about a half hour from at one point from the Pacific Crest Trail. So it'd be very easy for anybody in my family to drive out to various points along the PCT and they wouldn't even have to stop. I mean, they would they could be driving along the highway and kick a box out the window as as uh, they drove past me and I was waving. Um, but I said, no, we're not going to do that. I'm going to go in and I'm going to pick up all my resupply boxes, my myself and in fact one of the resupply boxes that i have to pick up to walk from the trailhead into the post office and get it it will take me two and a half times longer to walk that distance than it would if my wife was just to leave the house 
drive up to the trail and hand it to me. Um, but she's agreed. She says, okay, I'll just mail the box to the post office and you're gonna walk the miles. So that's ground rule number two, uh, self-supported uh, PCT through hike. And the third ground rule is I will be walking um, the official trail. This will be a continuous footpath. And uh, if I get off the trail to do a resupply, I will go back to that point on the official trail to, to begin again. It'll be a continuous footpath. And if there are any closures on the PCT due to um, uh, fire, that sort of thing, then, then I will walk all the miles of the official detour as well. I will not be doing any yellow blazing. I'll walk all those miles. And so that's ground rule number three that I, I put on my own through hike. These make sense to me. Um, uh, they do. They may not make sense to you. Maybe they'll make sense uh, towards the end of my journey. We'll, we'll see. But, uh, but those are the three ground rules I've added to my PCT through hike. Look, if, if now uh, you're watching my videos purely as entertainment, you're not going to go through hiking yourself. You have no desire to, to do that. And you're watching these purely as entertainment. Then I would say you can go ahead and stop now. Um, follow me on on Instagram or Facebook or you know subscribe to this YouTube channel uh, I'm gonna enjoy making the videos I'm gonna have a blast doing that I hope you enjoy them uh, I'm gonna have a lot of fun I think it's gonna be unique I think my through hike is gonna be unique compared to other PCT through hikes uh, just because of the ground rules I've added and in, the, in the, the current situation what's going on so I, I think it's gonna provide a unique perspective and and hopefully it is enjoyable uh, the videos are enjoyable to watch. But if, you, if, if you're just watching them for pure entertainment, I'd say this is a good place to, to end. Uh, the rest of the video that I'm going to be talking about right now is for the greater through hiker, through hiking community. And what I would like to talk about with that is the COVID-19 situation and kind of how it's unfolded in the through hiking community over the last couple months. Um, and when I talk about the greater through hiking community, what I'm, I'm referring to with that is uh, to me, you have the, the through hiker, the individual on the trail. Um, you have the individuals immediately around him or her um, that she, she, he or she or is hiking with. That's the trail family. The through hiker community to me is defined as the individuals on that long trail during that year that the through hiker is on it. So they're experiencing not only the same trail, but they're experiencing the same time period of that trail. That's the through hiker, through hiker community. And then you have the through hiker diaspora, the greater through hiking community. Those are former through hikers, be it on the same trail or another trail, and they're watching these videos and they're, they're contributing, uh, that sort of thing. Section hikers, many of whom know far more than, than through hikers. They're part of that community or aspiring through hikers. People want to go out and be section hikers, through hikers. That's what I'm talking about, the greater through hiking community. And that's what this, this next portion um, uh, I'm addressing too. Um, look, I, I think in our desire to do something when, when COVID-19 was first coming about in, in the United States. I think in our rush to do something, our desire to do something, I think we made two egregious errors. Um, and I'd like to go through those. Um, the first one is we painted the towns along the Appalachian Trail or the Pacific Crest Trail as these 17th century isolated hamlets, really cut off from the, the rest of of uh, society and the, and the through hiker would be swooping in um, you know it'd be you know the villagers come out and and then you know look Martha a stranger you know and and, and bring death and COVID destruction uh, along with him and in that picture of small town America uh, along the Pacific Crest Trail or the Appalachian Trail couldn't be further from the truth in the 21st uh, century um, you know, I, I, I got three master's degrees and, and um, uh, doing systems analysis, predictive analysis, looking at complex problems. That's what I did for a, for a living. Um, and and I, I taught complex adaptive systems and systems thinking at the Army War College. And I lived in an, a town, small town along the Appalachian Trail for five years. So I have personal experience on that. I remember talking to my barber one time and she's cutting my hair and I'm talking about a vet that's happening in the in the town that weekend and it was a big deal if you lived in the town it was a big deal and she didn't seem 
to know anything about it. And finally I said, well, don't you live here? And, and she said, no, I, I live in Lancaster. My barber would drive 50 miles each way for a barber gig to cut hair, 50 miles each way. And that's, that is small town America in the 21st century because we have these things called cars and people get into them and they drive. And so what you see now is people who live in these small towns don't actually work in these small towns. People who work in these small towns don't actually live in those small towns. And the small town grocery store, you know, the, the idea that, uh, uh, you know, a through hiker is going to come in, he's going to get the, the, the COVID-19 from one one small grocery store and he's going to walk and he's going to go over here and he's going to he's going to affect the next small small town grocery store. Look, we all know that the stuff on the shelves isn't grown, manufactured and processed in that small town. It's delivered and it's not delivered in one big vehicle. You know, here's your stuff. It, it comes in half a dozen vehicles, you know, uh, commodity service uh, centers that support these small towns. There's the, the, the truck that brings all the bread and the pastries, and there's the truck that brings the frozen, frozen goods, and then there's the one that brings like the hand lotions and shaving cream and all that kind of stuff, and then there's one that brings canned goods, and then there's one or two, uh, depending on the distribution licenses, that brings all the alcohol. And, and they don't just service that one small grocery store. They service that next grocery store and the next grocery store and the next grocery store. They serve in dozens and dozens of grocery stores over a thousand square miles. So the idea that a through hiker is going to come in and then he's going to infect the next small grocery store. Guess what? The distribution guy's been there several times over in the last week. He's beat you to the punch. Um, you know, compared to the interactive patterns of, of everything else that goes in these small towns, the through hiker is actually, I mean, he's operating in slow motion. So that's the first egregious error that we've created, um, is, is painting that picture of the small towns. And the second egregious error we did is we made the through hiker and through hiking out to be the most horrific act that you could do. I mean, you might as well give a through hiker the death sign instead of a trekking pole, because if he goes into one of these small towns, he is carrying, con you know, COVID-19 death with him. And, and we did it without any facts, without any evidence. Um, we just made that assertion and we made it a morality argument. We said, look, this is what I think. It's the right way to think. If you think different, you're wrong. And if you think differently, I'm going to vilify you and socially shame you on media. Uh, again, without any facts, without any evidence. Um, and, and that perception has stuck. Um, you know, you read any of these uh, social media uh, sites and someone will post an article. Hey, look, the, um, you know, the golf courses are opening up in California. Invariably, you will read down in, in comments, but it's not through hiking. Um, the skiing resort is opening up, but that's not through hiking. The beaches are opening up, but it's not through hiking. I'm waiting for somebody to post an article that the, the San Francisco 49ers stadium is opening up, you know, all seats available, come one, come all invariably down in the comments, but it's not through hiking. We have created that perception again, without facts, without evidence, without comparing, without contrasting. Um, and, and put that out there. Um, and, and the sad part is, this is a self-inflicted wound. You know, this wasn't externally driven hate crime. No, we did this to ourselves. We took the 38 caliber, we aimed it squarely at our foot, and we pulled the trigger. You know, last year uh, on the Appalachian Trail, a vet was killed and a woman was badly injured. Um, you probably know the story. A man was wielding a knife. He attacked the two. Um, the vet unfortunately died and, and, and the woman 
um, was able to escape, but, but she was badly, badly injured. Now, it would have been real easy for journalists to paint the picture that, look, this happened on the Appalachian Trail, and so the Appalachian Trail is a horrible place to be, and, and if you go on the Appalachian Trail, you're going to get attacked and, and killed. But that's not what happened. Um, what happened is journalists looked at the situation, and they said, look, yes, this is a tragic incident. This is not good. But if we look at the overall scheme, we look at all the facts, we do the comparing, qualify, qualitative, quantitative, compare and contrast all the threats, and look at that in totality, hiking on the Appalachian Trail is still very safe. And that is what we did not do looking at the through hiker. You know, we did not look at all the interactive patterns look at all the possible uh, ways that people could get infected in these small towns through COVID-19 and do the qualitative, quantitative compare and contrast analysis and see how the through hiker comes up. I actually did it myself. It comes out quite low for um, contagion through a, a through hiker, um, but we did not do that in, in general. And, and that's something we need to do uh, collectively uh, to be able to do that. That doesn't mean the risk isn't there. I'm not saying that, but it is low. And based on that, then we can develop mitigation strategies to move forward so we can make ourselves even safer and responsible through hikers. And we've done that before. We've been able to change behavior before. Um, and I'm going to give an example of that. Look, when I was growing up in, in, in the early college years, you know, the poop kit that we would have as backpackers, well, that consisted of this, you know, half roll of toilet paper, a plastic baggie. You went out, you kind of did your business. Uh, you used the paper. Um, you didn't back out the paper. You put a couple rocks on the, on the, what was left, and, and then you moved on. Um, and, you know, at that time, we knew you, you shouldn't put stuff, you know, in, in the fire and, and pack out everything, but we probably threw things in the fire, play, in the fire, uh, you know, thinking it would decompose that we shouldn't have. Well, through awareness, education, and training, we've learned about leave no trace. So we have evolved from the half roll of toilet paper um, to more sophisticated way of poop kit for, for traveling. I'll give you an example. This is what I'll be carrying on the, on the PCT. You've got your trowel, right? Deuce of spades, trowel, make the hole, make it deep. Um, and then after you've done what you need to do, uh, you got the field bidet. These actually work very good. Think of a brushless car wash. They're very effective. Um, and then you have the dehydrated towelettes. Just add a little water to it. It blows up quite strong. Takes care of any residual. Um, uh, after you're done with this thing, you don't put it in the hole. You put it in a baggie. You bring this out with you. Um, you bury just the you know, just that. And and then when you're all done with that, of course, you wash the hands with biodegradable soap. And and so and it goes beyond just the equipment, right? It's 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 behavior as well. You don't dig a cat hole right next to um, a, a water source. You go a few hundred feet. If you don't wash your clothes in the stream, you take water and you go a few hundred feet and, and, and you do that. It's all part of the leave no trace. Um, and, and that comes through awareness, education, and training. And we can do the same thing with COVID-19. So for my COVID-19 PCT kit, well, I've got my, my mask. Now, I wish this was an N3095 mask. I, that's what I would like to have is a couple of disposable N95 masks in, in my backpack and some in each one of my resupply kits, but we know we can't buy those right now and we shouldn't. We leave those to the healthcare providers. So my, my um, uh, mother-in-law actually sewed this for me. Nice thick material, double layered, keeps the moisture pretty good in. Yes, I've read the articles that say these aren't very effective, um, but it is better than nothing. Uh, and, and it certainly makes the person I'm talking to feel comfortable. So I've got that. Uh, I also have my buff. Now, I know people on the trail are using buffs uh, as protective. Uh, the problem with buffs is we know the material is stretchy for a buff and it's moisture wicking to begin with. I mean, that's the point we wear buffs. And so it 
wants to release the, the, the moisture, it wants to release the droplets. So it's probably not the best thing. So what I will do is I will use a mask and then I will use the buff to keep that in place. So that's what I will be doing. And then lastly, um, I have my sunglasses. I will also wear these inside. If I got to go into a grocery store, I'll have them on. They prevent droplets from coming into my eyes. Um, but most importantly, more importantly than that, it prevents me from touching my eyes. When I'm touching a counter, I'm touching food, that sort of thing. Um, I've got my glasses on. It prevents me from touching something and touching my eyes and becoming affected that way. So, so my sunglasses. And lastly, before I take any of that stuff off, um, I break out the biodegradable soap and I wash my hands and I take care of myself. So that is the COVID-19 kit that I will be carrying. And it goes, goes beyond just the equipment, right? It's, it's behavior as well. Um, if you're hiking the Appalachian Trail, don't sleep in a shelter. I mean, how tough is that? Uh, I'll be hiking the PCT. It's 400 miles longer than the AT. I'm not going to sleep in a single shelter. It's not like, you know, they're, they're going to invalidate your ATs, you know, through hiking certificate if you don't sleep in so many shelters. Just don't sleep in one. Don't sleep in a youth hostel when you go into town. If I owned a, a, a youth hostel on the AT or PCT right now, um, I would be, you know, rewriting my business plan and, and remodeling. Um, don't pile eight people into a hotel room um, and, and uh, you know, and if that means, uh, you know, it's, it's, you're not going to have as much money to go into hotels, you know, just go into hotels less. Uh, if you're out cowboy camping with your trail family, don't line up on the ground uh, you know, like a package of Oscar Mayer wieners. Spread out so you're not breathing each other's moist air all night long. Um, don't sit on the log that you know probably everybody that's walked by has sat on the log. Don't sit on that log. You know, grab your little butt pad and sit anywhere you like. Sit, sit you know, and enjoy that. Just don't sit on that common log. Don't do that. That's all behavior patterns. Don't get into the U-Haul with a dozen other people so you're breathing each other's air. Don't do that. In fact, don't take a ride walk into the towns. I mean, if you think about it, if you're on the Appalachian Trail sitting at the Southern Terminus in Georgia, or you're on the PCT sitting at the Southern Terminus in Campo, you have mentally made the commitment that you're going to be walking 2,200 miles to 2,600 miles. Well, just make the commitment that you're going to be walking another three miles. Um, it's okay, you know? And if the town is too far, don't go into that, don't go into that town. Now, I know some of you that are watching this are probably sitting there going, hey, Mike, that isn't the through hiking experience I had, you know, um, and, and you're probably right. It's not. Um, but one of the things we do know about COVID-19, there's a lot of things we don't know about COVID-19. One of the things we do know about COVID-19 is that realistically, it's probably going to be with us for several years. So we're trying to figure out what that new normal is going to be. Um, and, and that's going to encompass through hiking as well. So the through hiking experience of last year, we're probably not going to have that for a while. Um, and, and I know some of you are probably saying, hey, Mike, you know, those mitigation measures, they probably go a little too far. That's probably not needed. And you know what? I would agree with you. Those are just suggestions to put out there um, because we have not done the fact-based analysis. We haven't gone through and looked at all the risks and looked at the compare, qualitative, quantitative, compare, contrast of how people in these small towns would get uh, COVID-19 and how does that relate to the through hiker and what is that proportionality and then how do we make mitigation strategies based on that. We've never done that and now is the opportunity to be able to do that. You know, um, I, I think there are more veterans, vets on the PCT hiking uh, right now than proportionally right now this year than in previous years. Obviously, vets hike every year. It becomes part of the population. Um, 
but I think this year there are people hiking on the trail and I've been keeping track of it. Uh, I haven't, this is anecdotal information. I don't, I haven't done a survey, statistical analysis or anything else like that. Uh, but I have been tracking it. I think proportionally there are more veterans on the trail this year than in previous years. And the reason I started looking at it was the response I received back from my family on uh, my decision to delay my through hike. Now, now you have to understand that most people in my family um, have served in the in the military. My father, um, you know, a career service member, um, two combat tours in in Vietnam. My father-in-law, uh, U.S. Marine, uh, World War II in Korea. My wife, um, eight years Army officer. My best friend, uh, Army chopper t pilot turned Army doctor. Um, our children, both of them, uh, served three combat tours between the, the two of them. Uh, my, my daughter was medically retired um, from the military due to an injury she suffered in Afghanistan. Uh, her husband, my son-in-law, still serves today. He's got about 10 years before he's retirement uh, eligible. And, and most of my close friends, not all, but most of my close friends, uh, are either retired military or they're still serving today. And so when I made the announcement to this, this circle uh, that I would be postponing my through hike, um, you know, everybody was very supportive of that decision, but kind of the underlying response back that I got was, why? Why are you delaying? And based on what was going on seven weeks ago, um, uh, and how America was responding and how that was a different response that I, I mean I started to think about that why why the difference and and I started to go through it in my head and I started to track people on the trail and say hey are there other vets out there why is there a difference here and and I thought about it and, and I know people make the argument that uh, you know people on the trail uh, this year are being selfish um, well, let's face it, uh, through hiking any year, you, you get on a trail. It is an incredibly selfish act. Uh, it is all about the individual. Um, it is, it is self-centered, selfish thing to do. Um, it is a personal journey, a personal experience. So whether you're gonna do it last year, or the year before, whenever, it is a selfish thing to do. So so the, the idea that the people on trail this year are being being more selfish than any other year. No, I wasn't buying that. And so then I thought about it. Well, is the argument that they don't understand duty, duty to country. Uh, well, you know, veterans, um, they're one of the 1% in America that actually raised their hand and gave the oath to duty to country. And that, that required action uh, more than just, you know, sitting home and watching television. Uh, so no, I didn't buy the argument that uh, uh, they don't understand duty. Um, and, and then maybe, well, the other argument, they don't understand sacrifice, self-sacrifice. Um, and spend any time with a vet. Spend any time with a vet, peel that onion. And I think you're gonna find out that uh, all too often, uh, they have experienced and fully understand uh, sacrifice. So no, I didn't buy that argument. Um, and so I kept thinking about it, and then finally it dawned on me that vets are just wired differently based on experiences. Um, if you talk to a vet today, you know, we've, we've, been a, we've been a country at war for 20 years, and so you talk to a vet today, chances are that individual has seen combat. And in combat, um, you gotta get past all the bullshit. You gotta get past all the crap all the fear mongering and, and believe me there's plenty of fear mongering in combat and you got to get down to the brass tacks what is the threat to me today how do i deal with that and you develop mitigation strategies to protect yourself and protect those around you um, the delta the delta becomes acceptable risk and then you go i mean you don't have a choice that's what soldiers do that's what marines do they move out, they leave the perimeter, move out and draw fire, that's, that's the job. And so after a while of thinking that way, that thought process becomes ingrained into the head. And so subconsciously, I know my friends and family were doing the same thing. They were just, you know, hey, 
this is the threat. These are the mitigation strategies. This is what you can do. Move out, draw fire. Um, and, and I think that's what's going on in America today. Um, yes, the fatality numbers continue to go up. Yes, I'm watching the news. Um, and the economic impact of the pandemic, uh, we've just begun to see that. That's going to be going on for, for years. Um, but the initial shock and awe, the initial panic, the initial fear is, is over. And now people are realistically looking at the threat. And then they're determining mitigation strategies for themselves, for their family, for their community. And for some people, when the Delta, that becomes acceptable risk. For others, it's not. For those that's acceptable risk, they're leaving the confines of their home. They're leaving their yards. And they're, they're going out into their communities and they're trying to figure out a semblance of a new normal that likely they're going to be living with for a few years at least. And I think in the through hiking community, that's what we need to do as well. Um, so we can move forward because we've got about nine, 10 months for the next AT class or PCT class comes rolling out. And through education, awareness and training, we can provide them mitigation strategies on how to hike safely in a period of COVID-19. And I think we can, we can do that and we can do that responsibly. Now, uh, in the meantime, I'm getting out there. Uh, I'm ready to go. Like I said, I'm hitting the trail. It'll be in the mid-May time frame, um, and I will be posting videos on this YouTube channel. You want to follow me, Instagram, Facebook, Old Man on the PCT, or follow me on this YouTube channel, Old Man on the PCT. I'm going to enjoy myself. I think my videos, because of all my ground rules um, and the uniqueness of this year, uh, it's going to provide a unique perspective, and I think they're just going to be entertaining. I'm going to have a lot of fun enjoying uh, making them. Um, I hope you enjoy watching them and uh, I, I look forward to taking you along my journey. Uh, this is going to be great. I'm going to have a great time and uh, I think it's going to be great for you as well. Uh, look forward to, to sharing this experience with you. There was a time in this fair